Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. I'm Jason Pack, and this is Disorder. Just when you mega orderers thought that you'd heard all of my theories about how the global enduring disorder works, it turns out I have a new theory. I postulate that we are operating under a novel form of what I shall call peak enduring disorder. And this means that the democratic world's already diminished ordering capacity is so taxed that we simply cannot respond to new challenges. It doesn't matter how important the challenge is, if it's not of a certain kind, it flies under the radar. You know what, to me, epitomizes this phenomenon of peak disorder? It's the events of the last two months in Bangladesh. So in an attempt to order the disorder, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to shine a light on the early August protests in Bangladesh. The ouster of the long-established pseudo-democratic populist regime there, and how the ensuing crisis has sucked in disordering actors, opening up a new chapter in great power competition among India, the US and China, and even Russia over Bangladesh. And it truly epitomizes many of the core dynamics of the enduring disorder. Now, my dear mega orderers, I'm not gonna pretend to be a South Asia expert. In fact, it's one of the regions of the world that I understand the least. However, I've tried to do a lot of neutral reading. Here's my attempt to recap the story as best as I can. Bangladesh's embattled prime minister, Sheikh Hasina, fled the country on August 5, 2024, after weeks of protests that had resulted in hundreds of deaths. The country's president, Mohammed Shah Boudin, the armed forces, and the political parties selected a temporary caretaker government led by Nobel laureate Mohammed Yunus. Bangladesh has a tradition in the past of caretaker governments which would oversee elections. That had been abolished by Sheikh Hasina as part of her eviscerating the institutions and stacking the judiciary and other things with her loyalists. But this concept of a caretaker government is widely respected by the populace and embedded in the country's previous legal traditions. The key opposition party, the Bangladesh National Party, has a more Islamist bent than the Awami League connected to Sheikh Hasina, who's leaving. They have accepted the transition. They initially demanded an election in three months, but later said that they were willing to allow the interim government more time for reforms. Where we are in late September is that some factions in the country are growing upset with the nature of the caretaker government's reforms and the slow progress towards elections. I'm not going to pretend to understand more than that, so we need to go to our guest today, Michael Kugelman. He's the director of the South Asia Institute at the Wilson Center and a weekly columnist for Foreign Policy magazine. He has written that the fall of Hasina's political party called the Awami League is actually, and now I'm going to quote from his Daily Star article, which gets top billing in the show notes, quote, quite simple. Hasina's security forces resorted to egregious levels of violence against peaceful protesters, robbing Hasina of her legitimacy, which was already fragile due to growing economic stress and yet another questionable election and prompting the nation to rally around the protesters. Those repressive actions from the security forces also unleashed pent up public grievances against the state. The genie was let out of the bottle and eventually there was nothing else that Hasina or the Awami League could do other than step down. This quote explains that the situation has many parallels with the Arab Spring events and it follows a specific trajectory of a popular overthrow of an entrenched authoritarian regime, 
where the army could be made to flip on the incumbent autocrat. In a way, this mirrors things we talked about with Marcel Dursius a couple of weeks ago. So to help us unravel the disorder in Bangladesh, its implications for the world system, I'm very honored to be joined by Michael Kugelman. Welcome to Disorder, Michael. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Thanks for having me. So I mentioned that from my perspective, Bangladesh tends to fly under the radar. But it's a high strategic value state, right? I mean, think of its geographic location, over 100 million people, its garment industry that generates a lot of export earnings, close ties with world powers, possibility for geostrategic ports. Why is it that there is not a greater focus on Bangladesh in terms of international conferences? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, especially because if you look back at uh, the earliest days of Bangladesh, when it first achieved independence in 1971, it was actually a huge issue because very soon after this extremely traumatic, deadly independence war, Bangladesh was plunged into a horrific uh, crisis because of a terrible catastrophic flood. And this got the attention of the world in a big way. And uh, in fact, uh, you had some of the biggest musicians in the West, including George Harrison, uh, Robbie Shanker, others, Bob Dylan, I believe, put on this huge concert. And it was one of the biggest charity concerts known to anyone at that point. It was all about Bangladesh to bring relief to this brand new country. So at that very early point, it was in the news, perhaps for all the wrong reasons, because of its trauma, because of its tragedy and all of that. But you're right. Over the last few decades, if you look at how many media have covered Bangladesh, if you look at how Bangladesh has featured in policy debates, certainly in Washington and other capitals, not as much as you'd expect. And, you know, media coverage, I would argue, on many levels, has really looked at Bangladesh through reductive lenses. When you have floods, when you have factory fires, then it's in the news, but otherwise not as much so. Even as great power competition was becoming a bigger issue, even as attention was turning to the Indo-Pacific and to South Asia, not as much attention on Bangladesh as one would expect. And I think that, you know, it could come down to several factors. One, quite frankly, would be a good thing from the perspective of Bangladesh, that it was a country that, um, you know, for many years was in a relatively good place economically. It was relatively stable. You did have some periods of uh, militancy and some pretty difficult periods with terrorism, but that was relatively minor compared to what you would see in Pakistan or Afghanistan. So I'd argue that on one level, it's just that there wasn't much going on or not enough going on to warrant attention within the broader media sphere and also uh, on, on policy radars. You know, Bangladesh has long had good relations with most countries in the West and the global South. And so I think that, you know, from a policy level, there is a view that, okay, Bangladesh is doing well, things are okay, our relations are good with them. No need to really be focused on Bangladesh in a big way. Back to the Arab Spring analysis. We could talk about the quotas and all the problems and corruption or whatever in Bangladesh, but I'm more interested in the Arab Spring analysis. Was there a miscalculation that the seemingly autocratic leader thought, oh, I'm in full control, we can just kill these students or make them shut up, and they never thought, uh-oh, if we go in in a heavy hand, the whole regime could collapse? Yeah, that's exactly it. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, the Sheikh Hasina government had been one that had uh, been very confident and comfortable about putting down anti-government movements with the use of force. And there had been plenty of uh, protests against Sheikh Hasina and her government for many years, and she had always deployed force, and it uh, basically ended the crisis of the moment. But I think that what she underestimated in this case in August is that, first of all, she underestimated just how much anger there was among the general population, underestimated the fact that if you do one more case of cracking down hard, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. I think that she didn't fully appreciate that or she didn't let herself acknowledge that reality. The people, so many people were so angry because of so many years of repression. That's one factor. The other thing that she underestimated, and this is the real miscalculation, is that she authorized more force to be used than was typically the case when she would have her security forces crack down. You know, you know, we're not talking about police using tear gas and things like that and, and beating up some protesters. We're not talking about that. We're talking about cases of uh, police and paramilitaries using live fire on peaceful protesters 
that ended up killing dozens of people, including, according to investigations done by a very brave Bangladeshi journalist during this crisis, cases where you had about 40 people, 40 peaceful protesters that died after they were shot in the head. These are peaceful protesters. And the other big example that many have cited is the fact that you had paramilitaries flying in helicopters above the crowds, firing on them and killing uh, people. This also included cases where you had families living in high-rise apartments near the areas where there were protests and having children die because they were being held in their parents' arms who were looking out over the protest and you had stray bullets from these helicopters that hit them. So this is something else that Sheikh Hasina underestimated, that she thought that she could amp things up and get away with it. But clearly, particularly given how much pent-up anger there already was from previous years, it was just too much. And indeed, you know, it led to a, a situation that she could not survive politically. I like the way that you sketched that out because it shows something that we saw from the Arab Spring, which is that due to social media and smartphones, you can't do those kind of crackdowns. Now, what I want to get at is what did this tell us about her regime? Because if, if I bring to bear my Libya expertise, in Libya, when Qaddafi said on February 15th, 2011, open fire, let's just kill all the lawyers who are protesting. He was doing an old playbook. He thought, oh, this will work. We'll go in really hard. We'll just kill all the the dissidents because they're not supported by the rest of the population. And he didn't understand the extent to which he'd lost the support of larger groups of the population or how these images would hurt him. And it was very, very clear with Ben Ali in Tunisia that he didn't grasp the extent of the unemployment problem and how the symbolic nature of things would interact with others. But Hasina should have been a little bit more sophisticated, right? And, you know, she's had to rig and manipulate elections and pack the judiciary and things. How was she not aware of where she stood? Well, you know, I would argue that she actually, I mean, she was disconnected on many levels. And I think that she was someone that, uh, like many leaders of her ilk, uh, was surrounded by a small group of trusted advisors who were essentially uh, psycho fans in the sense that they only told her what she wanted to hear. And so she may not have been aware of the, of the full extent of the anger. But I will say this, that she was aware enough to be in a position to authorize that the internet be shut down across the country for nearly a week. This happened during the height of the uh, during the height of the protest, and so she knew that you know if you have the internet going, it's a lot easier for people to capture images on social media and put them out around the country, and that can galvanize people even more. So this is sort of an overlooked aspect of this crisis that you know her government actually shut the internet down across the entire country for nearly a week, and despite that. Somehow you had people that were able to get these images out there in social media with friends, family outside of Bangladesh. And it was those people through their Twitter accounts and other accounts that were able to give the world and the first indication of what was going on. Only later when the Internet was restored did many in Bangladesh get a, a sense as to the full extent of what was happening. But yeah, to your point... Yeah, I mean, Sheikh Hasina did not resort to the type of rhetoric that Gaddafi did, as you described. But, uh, you know, she was still, I think, fearless in the sense that, uh, you know, early on in the, in the, in the crisis, she, she insulted the protesters. She described them as, uh, as Razakars, which essentially is a term referring to them as traitors. So she kept pouring more fuel into the fire again and again. And indeed, I think it comes down to the fact that she just didn't know the extent of what was happening on the ground because, she wasn't, you know, people that were close to her, and she didn't trust many people. People close to her didn't let her get a truer sense of, of what was actually happening. Wow. Hearing your explanation there really reminds me of episode 67 with Marcel Dursis, Dictator's Disorder and Quest for Internal Security, that we're going to put a link to in the show notes. And one of the things that he said is that the more a leader centralizes power, the more she or he and it is usually a he, which makes Sheikh Hasina a very interesting story, the more she was reliant on those few nodes to give her information, to support her, to give good suggestions. So because power was so centralized, those 20 advisors and five business families or whatever, she really needed their support and needed them to advise in the correct way. And if they were not providing that advice, or they were ready to flip-flop, or they counseled the wrong advice, then the tyrant, 
or aspiring tyrant really is in a bad position. No? Oh, absolutely. But and yet this is actually what contributed to her downfall as well, that that very small inner circle let her down. And that's specifically because of the army chief. During the Sheikh Hasina era, or at least during the, the 15 consecutive years of her rule, the army had her back. She had the support of the army, but it turned on her in the end, in the sense that uh, the army had been uncomfortable with her authorizing police, paramilitaries, student wings of her party to use such egregious levels of force. The army was actually not very present on the streets. It was not out there doing the dirty work. It was mostly other security forces that were doing that. And in the end, the army chief, who incidentally is a relative of Sheikh Hasina, he said to her, that basically, we're unwilling to abide by your orders to enforce this latest uh, crackdown and curfew. We're just not comfortable with it. So essentially, that was his way of telling Sheikh Hasina that the army was no longer going to support her. And once that happened, she knew and her family knew that she could not stay in power anymore because she couldn't count on the army to protect her and her family. So the very next day after she had that conversation with the army chief, she decided to step down. It was actually her son. Many of her family members are based outside of Bangladesh. Her son, who's based in northern Virginia, as I understand it, he was the one that said that it's time for her to leave, get on the helicopter, fly to India. But yeah, even her tiny inner circle really abandoned her. And if you look at how things played out after she left, many of her, her inner circle were arrested, jailed. Some of them were able to sneak out. But I think that even with that, in that small inner circle, not many remaining supporters of her right now because everyone is just feels that uh, you know they were abandoned by her. What really interests me about the situation in Bangladesh is the way that it's become a battleground for geopolitical competition. This is a state where the top external power is not the US or Russia or China, but in fact, India. And India had been the protector of the previous Sheikh Hasina regime. And now it's unclear what is going to be the relationship of the new regime to India, China, Russia, the US. You could say that India has a new self-confidence that with Modi's consolidation of power, despite his weak electoral performance in the last election, he has made South Asia India's sphere of influence. He doesn't allow the US or the UK to tell India what to do anymore. So is it correct to say that before this crisis, India was trying to get a sphere of influence over so other South Asian states like Bangladesh or Sri Lanka? Yeah, I do think that because of India's size and its population and its clout relative to other countries in South Asia, it has viewed itself as a natural leader and certainly a regional power. And that has lended itself to perceptions harbored by some of the smaller states of South Asia that India is trying to be a, a regional hegemon of sorts and a regional bully. And this has played out in very different ways. I mean, we, we all know the story about India's troubled relationship with Pakistan, but I think that the more vivid examples occur with other countries. So for example, some years ago, India decided to um, impose a blockade on the delivery of goods uh, into Nepal. And India never gave a clear reason why it was imposing that blockade, but it was something that was extremely troubling and upsetting for the Nepal government and for the Nepalese in, in general, just because of the economic implications. So there, is, there are these perceptions among many in the region that um, India has sought to impose its will and do things its own way and hope that others just follow along. But that aside, I mean, India does have and has long had significant levels of influence across South Asia. Though, as China has moved in, so to speak, uh, over the last decade or so, through the vehicle of the Belt and Road Initiative, that has been very concerning for India. And it's sharpened this longstanding competition between India and China. And Bangladesh is indeed one of the places where this competition has played out. But yeah, to your question, yeah, I'm not sure I'd use the term sphere of influence, but I do think that India has been able to successfully develop presence and influence in many countries across the region, there's some countries like Bhutan and, and Nepal, where for many years, India was really the sole external player to the point that you had significant levels of dependencies. Maldives is another example. But again, this has changed in more recent years as China uh, and to an extent Russia as well have become more active, which is something that has intensified this growing great power competition. Yeah. So if you look at it in this chessboard way, 
certainly the Trump administration and the Boris Johnson administration, they were okay with backing Modi in these external relationships so long as Modi was opposing China. In other words, you could imagine Trump or Brexit Britain being like, great, we'll just support however Modi wants to approach Bangladesh because then it won't fall into the Chinese lap. But where does this leave us now with Biden-Harris and with a different approach towards Modi? It's interesting that you're right, that the China factor has been a driving factor in this growing relationship between the U.S. and India and many many of the U.S.'s Western partners and partners across the board have strengthened their relations with India. And a big reason why is shared concerns about China. But you know, Bangladesh is a bit different in the sense that this is one place where the U.S. and India have not seen eye to eye in the sense that the Modi government had long been very close to Sheikh Hasina and her party. They had really, quite frankly, seen Sheikh Hasina as the only viable political option from India's perspective because of a view that was shared equally by Sheikh Hasina and Narendra Modi that if Sheikh Hasina were to lose power, that that vacuum would be replaced by entities that are hostile to India, particularly political parties that are uh, sympathetic to Islamist causes and, and so on. For several years, you had a fair amount of pressure coming from the U.S. directed at Sheikh Hasina and her government to do more to strengthen democracy, to strengthen rights, and to ensure that there will be free and fair elections, whereas India thought that pressure was a terrible idea because it risked undercutting Sheikh Hasina. And this puts the U.S. and India in a bit of a tricky position now vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh because the U.S. government has been very happy to commit to a partnership with Mohammed Yunus and his interim government. You know, Yunus is someone that's very well known and well regarded, not just in the U.S., but you know, across the world. Whereas India is very hesitant to engage with this new government in Bangladesh and quite frankly, I think, does not want to. So there's a bit of a disconnect for the U.S. and India. But in terms of your question about where this brings us for the U.S. and India and looking to the presidential election coming here, you know, I'll say this, that there is pretty strong bipartisan support in Washington in favor of a continued strong partnership with India. The main reason why is that great power competition with China is something that is rooted in uh, bipartisan support, this idea that you know the U.S. has to do what it can to work with its allies and partners to counter China. And India is viewed by Democrats and Republics alike as America's best strategic bet in South Asia to work with the U.S. to counter China. So the Bangladesh bid in this case is somewhat tangential. Yes, the U.S. and India don't see eye to eye on Bangladesh now, but it's not something that's going to impact the broader dynamic at play. Sticking with the U.S., on the disorder pod, we love a good conspiracy theory. We like to unpack its multiple layers of meaning. So in Bangladesh right now, there are some conspiracy theories about there being an external hand, especially that of the U.S., in how the mass movement against Sheikh Hasina gained traction. This leads to the question, what is the role of the U.S. and Britain in backing the opponents? And what are the role of the different Bangladeshi diasporas in the U.S. and U.K. towards the events? Yeah, I mean, if you're interested in conspiracy theories, uh, there's no shortage of, uh, of them to discuss in this context. In, in my view, in the view of so many other analysts and others, they're all uh, false in this context. So there are actually two main conspiracy theories playing out, or that have been playing out vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh in recent weeks. One is that, as you know, the U.S. or other external actors were, were behind this mass movement that led to Sheikh Hasina's ouster. The other conspiracy theory is that since Sheikh Hasina left and resigned, that um, religious minority communities, particularly the Hindu minority community in Bangladesh, are experiencing uh, severe levels of violence and even pogroms and a genocide, as some advocating this conspiracy theory have said. So happy to discuss both of them. They're both completely wrong in my view uh, and in the view of so many others. But in terms of the first one, the issue of external involvement, yeah, I think here you have to look at Sheikh Hasina as a leader and you have to look at, uh, at those close to her and their views of the U.S. During Sheikh Hasina's time in power, U.S.-Bangladesh relations actually grew in a big way. Trade picked up, strategic cooperation picked up, defense ties picked up in a big way. And yet Sheikh Hasina is someone that has long harbored suspicions toward the U.S. And I want to jump in. This is because, dear listeners, so much in Bangladeshi politics is seen through the lens of 1971 and its aftermath. And 1971 is the war between 
East Pakistan that became Bangladesh and West Pakistan, which is now Pakistan. And at this key moment, the United States sided mostly with Pakistan. And if we look back at the role that Nixon and Kissinger played, despite the fact that Pakistan would go on this trajectory to become Islamist and have a whole range of other problems, those were our allies. And Bangladesh was seen as socialist and potentially falling into the Marxist and Russian camp. And that there's this multi-decade resentment, particularly among Sheikh Hasina and her ilk, who derived so much of their legitimacy from their role in the 1971 events, right? Yeah. In fact, that's exactly what I was going to say, that, uh, you know, she sees the U.S. role in 71, the U.S. backed the Pakistani military. I mean, that's very clear. We know that. And her view is that the U.S. has tended to side with some of her worst enemies, uh, you know, her view is that the U.S. has sheltered uh, several of the collaborators with the Pakistani army in 71. And, uh, you know, she knows that uh, the U.S. is very close to Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad Yunus is actually a controversial figure to some extent in Bangladesh in that he became a very sharp critic of Sheikh Hasina and her government. So Sheikh Hasina has long seen Yunus as a as a political enemy, and she knows that the U.S. has good relations with him. So that's an important context to keep in mind. So what she did is she started making these allegations that the U.S., for example, had threatened to, uh, to, to overthrow her if it wasn't willing to receive ownership of an island near Bangladesh called St. Martin's. I mean, this is completely fake. I mean, it's not true. This came out of nowhere. Also, when Hasina was still in power, she made a speech in parliament about a year ago when she essentially said that the U.S. was was waging a regime change against her. This was about a year ago. The main reason she said that is that this was a time when there was a lot of pressure, public pressure coming from the U.S., uh, pushing her to ensure to have a free and fair election. This was a time when the U.S. ambassador in Bangladesh was meeting with uh, leaders of opposition parties. This is what diplomats do. They meet with members of opposition parties. In her view, this is all an indication that the U.S. was up to no good. So fast forward to what happened August 5th when she was removed. Those close to her, those that support her, started putting out these ideas that the U.S. orchestrated this in some way. And also, this is something that got an especially large amount of traction in India. There are many in India that tend to be suspicious about U.S. intentions because of U.S. policies toward India going back many years, including support for the Pakistani military in the 71 war. In my view, it boggles. It doesn't make any rational sense. How could the U.S. have been behind this? Was the U.S. essentially paying off the Bangladeshi security forces to crack down hard on the Bangladeshi public? You know, it doesn't make sense from a logical perspective, but it is important to acknowledge that this is a conspiracy theory that has gained a lot of traction among uh, those close to Hasina and many in India. Conspiracy theories aren't meant to make sense from a rational perspective. They express an emotional or metaphysical truth from the hearer's perspective. In other words, people feel that we've been screwed by the U.S. Ergo, we're willing to accept a conspiracy theory that they're behind the coup. We're having an upcoming episode with Joe Uzicki. And I'm going to try to unpack there how conspiracy theories need to be read against the grain and understood in different ways. So I think that this conspiracy theory is quite interesting because you could imagine that a lot of Bangladeshis who harbor resentment over the American role in 1971 would quote unquote believe it vis-a-vis -vis this coup because it expresses something that resonates with them emotionally. So that's a lot about the U.S. Can we discuss China and Russia, right? How are China and Russia moving in and seeing, aha, we can position ourselves with this new government? Yeah, so I, I would actually argue that you had this great power and major power interest and presence in Bangladesh well before this recent crisis in Bangladesh. I mean, you go back many years when, when India and China and Russia were key players in Bangladesh. So, you know, I would argue it's not like you needed this shock event, this political crisis to produce an outcome where suddenly you have these great powers moving in. And I would actually argue that it was specifically with China and Russia, I actually think they're, they're beneficiaries of this change in that, you know, they knew they had to know that there's multipartisan support in Bangladesh for friendship with China and with Russia. So, you know, no matter what was going to happen, there was going to be opportunities for Beijing and Moscow to engage. And that is because, you know, there's a widespread view 
among the broader political, strategic class, the strategic elite in Bangladesh, that China and Russia provide support that is very essential for Bangladesh. In the case of China, that's essentially infrastructure support. I mean, Bangladesh is a key destination for BRI support. And with Russia, interestingly, it's nuclear energy. Russia has had this niche presence, so to speak, in Bangladesh for many years as a main external supplier of Bangladesh's nuclear energy. Bangladesh does not depend heavily on nuclear energy on the whole. It's much more dependent on natural gas and so on. But nuclear energy is a big deal. And so there is not going to be any indication that uh, you know the new government in Bangladesh was going to tell Russia and China not to do business with Bangladesh anymore. But that said, you know, I think that if you look at this more broadly, you have an interim government that is keen to engage with the world on the whole. It wants to manage relations with just about everyone. That's not a new policy. But I think with the Sheikh Hasina government, relations with India were so close and so special that I think that that might have compelled the government back then to not go so far with China, for example, that you could risk upsetting India. But with this new interim government now, there's not as much of a concern about that. So, yeah, I mean, we've seen the U.S. state very enthusiastically as looking forward to working with the government. There was a senior U.S. government delegation in Dhaka some days ago where the main message was, was we're here to help. We want to help with your reforms process. We want to help with development assistance. There was a USAID deal that was signed during that delegation visit. So the odd one out here is India, right? India is the one that's unsure about how to go about this because it feels so uncomfortable about the new political realities. And after the break, let's hear more about the Bangladeshi economy and its reliance on IMF loans. The European Union is at war with illegal immigration. People once welcomed. I feel now I, I have a, a, a new life, a new life are now hunted. Migrants are dying. Are we animals or human? Voters are angry. Noi siamo persone. But migration hasn't stopped. So is this a war that EU politicians can win? Are you a democratic state or are you not? And who are the people standing in their way? Borders are not just difficult, they are also killing people. Fortress Europe is an in-depth, on-the-ground journey into the dark side of EU migration policy from the shores of the Mediterranean to the streets of Dublin. With me, journalist Andrew Connolly. Available on Apple, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. Mega Orderers, wanted to tell you guys about another podcast that I really like, The Jordan Harbinger Show. We're really fortunate to have Jordan as a guest later this year. He is a superstar. His show features in-depth interviews with some of the world's most fascinating minds. And what Jordan brings to the pod is a cool, calm Californian energy talking about tech regulation, but then also relationships and some self-help advice. He also speaks with some of the most fascinating minds out there, like Jamie Metzl and Bill Browder, it's really a must listen for any of you mega orderers out there. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Before we delve deeper into how there could be geopolitical struggle over Bangladesh, I think we need to interject some economics, right? And the situation in Bangladesh was able to happen because of economic concerns and unemployment. What about this IMF bailout? Is it likely that the IMF and the interim government can reach some kind of bailout? Bangladesh indeed had been experiencing stress, uh, economic stress for several years. And uh, one thing that the Bangladesh government under Hasina had done was conclude a new deal with the IMF. But I do think that this new government is going to have to find ways to ensure that that IMF support continues. I think it should be a, a fairly easy light lift for the interim government just because of you know who's in charge now. I mean, if you look at uh, you know Mohammed Yunus and the, the main economic advisors, including the current head of the Central Bank of Bangladesh, Astan Mansour, these are people that are well-respected as scholars and leaders 
respected by the international community on the whole, certainly respected by the IMF. And I think that this is clearly a government that is committed to reforms. And, you know, reforms are always a big thing for the IFI. They want to see commitment to, you know, fiscal reforms and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, this interim government is, is really committed not just to fiscal reforms, but to widespread institutional reforms that are meant to depoliticize uh, public economic institutions that have become very corrupt and, and, and nepotistic and all kinds of things. So I think those are all good signs from the perspective of, of the IMF. I'm really interested in the optimism that you seem to have about the reforms that this caretaker government could achieve. That inspires me. I love me some good institutional reform. And I guess when I look at a place like Bangladesh, I make an assumption that there was reasonably good rule of law beforehand, so 20 or 30 years ago, and that that has gotten much worse over time. Is that right? Well, unfortunately, no. I mean, I think that one could argue that these issues have been in, in place for quite a few years. I do think that the institutional capacities have certainly gotten worse over the last 15 years. But, you know, Bangladesh's history has alternated between the, the rule of Sheikh Hasina and her Wamili party, and then the other main political party, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. And honestly, I think in, in all of those cases, the you know, institutions were politicized, they were corroded, they were uh, not accountable. And then, of course, you also had the periods of military rule when civilian institutions were basically nothing. They were completely uh, hollowed out. But uh, yeah, I do think things got particularly bad over the last 15 years. Isn't there like a bit of a turkey issue going on here whereby before when there was a change of power, yes, different groups would use their time in government to consolidate their loyalists into the institutions, but at least because the groups shifted and the institutions were reasonably strong, there was some balance. But Sheikh Hasina has largely pulled an Erdogan and she's just been in power for so long, she stacked all the institutions with her loyalists. So so where does this leave Mohammed Yunus if he wants to shake things up? Is he making progress or is this just really intractable? Because to get to the root of the problem, you're going to have to tear up the country's institutions. Yeah, this is a critical point. And so I, I would not say that I'm necessarily optimistic about the prospects of achieving these reforms. I'm optimistic that there is political will to pursue them. And indeed, they already have been pursued. There have been a number of commissions that have been established to oversee reforms in different sectors. And it seems like the priority is in the business sector and the banking, a lot of banking sector reforms that have been begun uh, to this point. But yeah, I mean, this is going to be really difficult just because, uh, you know, you have a country where, you know, the institutions have been so thoroughly politicized for so long, and that became so much of a more acute problem over the last 15 years. I certainly think there's a where do we start kind of dynamic at play here. And it seems that the interim government has decided that where we start is with commissions to have, you know, well-respected people come together and discuss uh, what to do. But there's always going to be vested interests, always. And even if one could argue that there's a lot of support, public support behind these reforms, and I really think there is, but there's always going to be holdouts. And one could argue that, uh, you know, the Awami League has really become a weakened force. It's not in a position to push back against what the interim government is trying to do. But bureaucracies can be very powerful and they can be very resistant. So I think that that is going to make it very difficult for this interim government to make progress. And the other challenge, the related challenge for the government, for the interim government here, is that you know the public is going to be watching. The public is impatient. The public has been told that there will be elections once you have progress and success with the reforms. But the interim government is not an elected government. And if more time goes by and uh, the economy is not getting better, I think that you could start getting more criticism from the public if there's not a lot of progress in these reforms that the interim government has promised. The interim government has been really vocal about recovering stolen assets from abroad and being seen to fight corruption. And we see this a lot in post-regime change situations. Like if we think about Arab Spring stuff, obviously, despite the chaos that has played out in post-Qaddafi Libya, all the governments say, we're going to get the Qaddafi and assets from abroad. We're not going to pay for the corruption. We're going to sue the contractors that were in bed with Qaddafi cronies and giving kickbacks. 
but then they've not really been able to do it. They don't recover any of the assets. And, and here's an amazing statistic, which is that less than 5% of money laundered assets globally are ever reclaimed. And in my case in Libya, essentially the Qaddafi billions are hidden abroad. And then, you know, the different Turkish construction companies that benefited from this and that, they never pay back money that they, you know, made because they was on a quote unquote legitimate contract. So is this focus on getting stolen assets going to be a political mistake because it's just setting the government up for failure and raising expectations? Yeah, great question. That that may well be the case. And I think that there's a lot of pressure on the government to try to pursue that step or to try to pursue it just because it's in line with this broader focus on countering corruption and making Bangladesh cleaner and ensuring that money and revenues are, are, are managed more responsibly and more uh, ethically and so on. But yeah, it's going to be very difficult. I mean, there is a lot of pressure on Bangladesh government to do this, not just from the Bangladeshi public, but from uh, many members of the diaspora. As I understand it, some of this money has been laundered in the U.S., or was laundered in the U.S. by the Sheikh Hasina government. A lot of Bangladeshi Americans want to see that money return to Bangladesh. So you're right that the interim government may be setting itself up to fail here, given how difficult it is to carry this off. But I think that, you know, in the immediate moment, and for many political figures, you know, the immediate moment is what counts the most. I think that it's important to at least suggest that there is this commitment to try to get this uh, looted money back into the country. So let's order the disorder, Michael. If you were in Eunice's position, what are the reforms that you would focus on? I mean, I think that He's on the right track by trying to do everything he can to ensure that um, public institutions are not political, so to speak. And I think that the right place to start, and this is where he's starting, as I understand it, is with economic institutions. You know, it's critical. You, you got to start somewhere. And uh, economic stabilization is, is certainly a priority of the moment. And so it's going to be very difficult to have effective economic policies stabilization policies, macroeconomic stabilization, if you continue to have, you know, government institutions that don't work and don't function as they should. So I think that really is the place to start. But I think that I would also tell him that it's important to cast a wider net. And as much as this fixation on reforms is important, I think it's important to look beyond uh, Bangladesh as well. You know, we've talked on several occasions during this conversation about the Bangladeshi diaspora. You know, you've got some very successful Bangladeshi American professionals, Bangladeshi uh, Canadian professionals, Bangladeshi Britons, Australia. I think that you have people that could in some ways help bolster parts of the private sector in Bangladesh that are not really doing what they could just because you haven't had these long-term investments in growing out a private sector. And I can identify several specifically, uh, IT, for example, ICT, pharmaceuticals, electronics, manufacturing, beyond textiles. Essentially all the sectors that the South Asian diasporas are involved in in New Jersey exactly. and in the UK. And right. This really connects to things that we heard from Armen Sarkisian, the former president of Armenia, which is that for any small nation, and Bangladesh is not small in population, but it's small in terms of its economic footprint on the global stage, it's going to need to draw on its diasporic networks because it can have the disordered world around it disorder it, or it can draw on the ways to benefit from that disorder, which is all of its skilled people and, and assets abroad and use them to help order the disorder at home. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at how Bangladesh's economic success story began, you know, it's very interesting. People talk about, you know, the RMG sector. People talk about Bangladesh's uh, remarkable successes in, uh, in ensuring you've got a large number of women in the labor economy. These are all true, but you actually have to go and look at remittances. It was actually when you started having Bangladeshis abroad that were starting to send a lot of money back to Bangladesh. Those helped create the conditions, the macroeconomic conditions for those other things that I mentioned. But what economists will note is that Bangladesh has been unable to transition from having the Bangladeshi diaspora be a, a key source of remittances to being a key source of FDI, of investment. That's what's missing. That's a great solution to order the disorder. Now, if we close just by speaking about some geopolitical risks... Am I inventing things when I worry about if Bangladesh becomes more Islamist in nature and that we could be seeing a security risk? Because the, the regime that went out of power was anti-Islamist and pro-minority and promoted a very moderate form of Islam. 
But now some of the opposition groups, although more moderate than Islamists elsewhere, they do have a political Islamist bent. Is this something that we should be concerned about? And how should Western governments plan ahead or coordinate about this? Yeah, this is a critical point. I'm glad you brought this up. I'm concerned. I I mean, I definitely reject this notion that some, particularly in India, have advanced that Bangladesh could become the next Afghanistan. That's not going to happen. That's not how Bangladesh is. But it is true that um, some of the more hardline religious elements and Islamist uh, political parties have been empowered by the changes in Bangladesh because they have been for a long time critics of Sheikh Hasina and her party, which sought to project themselves as a secularizing force in Bangladesh that could keep at bay these religious, these Islamist forces. And yet now we we know that uh, Jamaat Islami, which is a very large religious political party, which is not only present in Bangladesh, it's present in, in many countries across the Muslim world, including in the Middle East, as you know, it had been banned by the Hasina government. It had been banned from contesting elections. One of the first things the new government did was unban it. So it's very much on the scene. The other major political party, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, is very close to the Jamaat uh, Islami. You have other Islamist entities that I think have been empowered and given more political space. And I also think that the interim government is going to want to keep those groups at hand's end, sort of give them space because Yunus himself must recognize that you know they were indirect allies of the people that now run the country because, you know, these these religious forces had supported the mass movement. The mass movement was was orchestrated by student leaders who are generally secular in their outlook, but these religious forces took advantage because they saw Hassan as an enemy as well. So what this means, unfortunately, is I think that the interim government is going to feel uncomfortable trying to push back against anything that these religious forces may want to see. And I'll give one specific example. We heard in the Bangladeshi media that a top leader of a terrorist group in Bangladesh called Ansar al-Islam, formerly the Ansarullah Bangla team, a group inspired by al-Qaeda and inspired by the writings of Anwar al-Awlaki, you know, a top al-Qaeda ideologue. Uh, this guy was released from a Bangladeshi prison. Charges were suddenly dropped against him. He had been in jail because his group had been behind the killings of several bloggers and, and others in Bangladesh several years ago. Why did this happen so suddenly? Why were the charges dropped so suddenly? I'm assuming that some of these hardline elements that have now become more influential pressure the government to release this guy. This guy, since he's been released, he hasn't gone quietly into the night. You know, he's been saying all these terrible things about India and all these things. This is absolutely something to worry about from a law and order perspective, but also from, I think, from a more broader stability perspective. And, you know, we haven't heard the government say anything about the release of Romani, this terrorist leader that was released. I don't want to overstate this threat, but I do think that if we want to look about stability trajectories in Bangladesh moving forward, this is certainly something to keep an eye on. Of course, there is a small Islamist threat or a jihadi threat from less than 1% of the population. It is something to be aware of, but it's not the overarching geopolitical issue in Bangladesh. It makes me think that coordination among allied powers in dealing with Bangladesh, giving the support that is needed maybe to security services, that that's going to be critical. I think the coordination of Western powers in having a unified approach towards Bangladesh is important but we haven't really spoken about many examples where it's happening. So what can the West do as a bloc to help keep Bangladesh from falling into China's orbit? Can there be conferences? Can there be non-IMF loans? Do we need carrots and sticks? If you were ordering the disorder, how would you instruct the EU, US, and UK to work together in approaching Bangladesh? Yeah, I mean, there is an opportunity because, you know, as we said at the very beginning of this conversation, uh, for too long, not enough countries in the West paid enough attention to Bangladesh. But that's different now. There, you know, it is in the spotlight uh, and on policy levels. A lot of a lot of Western capitals are thinking about it. Look, you know, I think here one could pick up on uh, what the U.S. has sought to do with its Indo-Pacific policy, which has a lot of support from its Western partners and its partners in in, in Asia as well, and that is to try to provide options opportunities, alternatives to Bangladesh that could be 
hopefully perceived by Bangladesh as better than or separate from what it might get from China. China has a comparative advantage when it comes to the delivery of infrastructure, infrastructure support, that type of thing. I don't really think that the West can hold a candle to that, quite frankly. But what else can the U.S. and its Western partners bring to Bangladesh that China does not or cannot or does not provide on the level of value that you could get from the West? And here you could talk about a variety of things, clean energy technologies, certain forms of soft infrastructure, whether you're talking about semiconductor cooperation, that type of thing. So I think it's about thinking, what can the West do differently or better than what China is doing? Easier said than done, for sure, right? I mean, the China is just much more present in Bangladesh in terms of you know how much investments it has, its assets, and so on, compared to the U.S. and its Western partners. But I think I think it would be important to uh, to start there. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, the West has to think about what we can do better than China, and then actually offer it. And I think that has to do with coordinating skills between the EU, UK, and US, and between our private sector and government sector, because there's tons of things in the tech industry and in education that we have to offer that Russia and China can't. We just probably haven't coordinated them and put them on one platter to help our allies. So I hope we do. I hope you mega orderers have enjoyed this conversation with Michael Kugelman. It has been a really deep dive. Um, I learned a ton. And I think it puts in sharp focus that events in a corner of the world like Bangladesh really mirror those elsewhere. And that's the thing about the enduring disorder is that events happening in Libya and Egypt can be quite similar to things that happen 10 years later in Bangladesh. And I hope that it could be an example of a domain where the disorder really could be ordered because the macroeconomics are not bad, the population is moderate, they have a decent economy, they speak English, and that there's an opportunity to seize on someone like Mohammed Yunus and this caretaker government to reform the institutions and actually order the disorder. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed producing it. If you did, please tap follow wherever you get your podcasts. And even more so than usually, because this is such a fascinating and complicated topic, we're going to have a long sub stack. You can get that sub stack by following the link in the show notes. And I'm going to have lots of articles about what happened on August 5th, why Sheikh Hasina stepped down. As always, our producer has been George McDonough. And our executive producer is Neil Fern. I am signing off from a place not so far from Bangladesh. I'm in the Emirates right now. So it is from these rather sultry and roasting climbs that I wish you an orderly week. Mm-hmm.